Um, we have the privilege of uh, spending your evening uh, tonight with uh, Dr. Terry Wright. He was my professor at uh, St. John Vianney Seminary, um, teaching social and political philosophy, uh, among others. Um, but I think that was your favorite. Well, it's where I did Dorothy Day, at least. Where yes. I was able to work her into the And that's curriculum. where um, she first entered my sphere. And then at some point, um, you went on sabbatical, and this was the fruit of your uh, work. And so... Um, Part of the beauty of um, the Catholic faith, as you saw, is one of the pillars in chapter 3 is distributivism, or uh, acting locally uh, in a local economy. And so we, um, last year we had uh, Father Greg Boyle, and then this year I wanted to uh, draw local from the richness of the Catholic intellectual life that we have here in the Archdiocese of Denver. And um, and so tonight we have uh, nine... Uh, pre-formulated questions and then if there's follow-up um, or you need clarification or things like that um, then that'll be a uh, good time to tack those on at the end yeah and, and, and so uh, I think if people want to jump in at some point they should feel welcome to do so yeah and so then you're welcome to politely interrupt um, beautiful so dr. Terry we're very happy to have you here We'll begin in prayer. This is the prayer for the canonization of servant of God, Dorothy Day, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God, our Father, your servant, Dorothy Day, exemplified the Catholic faith by her life of prayer, voluntary poverty, works of mercy, and witness to the justice and peace of the gospel through Jesus. May her life inspire your people to turn to Christ as their Savior, to see his face in the world's poor, and to raise their voices for the justice of God's kingdom. We ask that through her own witness, that her own witness may be be recognized by the church, and that you grant the following favor that we ask through her intercession. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first question is um, somewhat open-ended, starting off with the notion of justice. And so if you could just kind of even pin down, I think even the word justice kind of gets pulled like Laffy Taffy here and there. And not that you're going to give the over, but but just like justice through the eyes of Dorothy Day. Hmm. And... um, in the best way that you could. Okay. Well, um, you know, Aristotle defines justice as uh, each getting their due. Okay. Um, doesn't mean each getting the same, but each getting their due. And I think, in some sense, that would still apply to how Dorothy Day talked about it. But what we have to, I think, what is at work is we have to understand what is due to a human person, right? And that since each human person is born with the same dignity, um, they are all due uh, certain basic human, uh, they all have certain basic human rights of, uh, of uh, freedom from fear and uh, health care and, uh, you know, being fed and so on and so forth. So those are the things that are due persons qua human beings, just that that's what we're all due, right? So I, I think that that is um, a still a um, an accurate understanding of what she thinks justice is, but you know, fundamentally it's grounded in the dignity of the person. Beautiful. Um, you heard my setup uh, two weeks ago of the introduction to this book in which I brought up um, Pope Leo XIII as um, some jokingly being seen as this staunch conservative and even the notion, the false notion of, of there's justice and conservatism as if they're inherently opposed to each other. Um, can you can you exempt, can you uh, set up the social encyclicals as we had talked about them? Kind of that was part of your chapter three, but can you set them up in um, a few highlighted points? Um, the takeaway of of the church. Both the church's concern for the worker, the church's concern for the poor, 
as even an intellectual tradition that Dorothy Day would have inherited as opposed to kind of inventing oh, yeah. on her own? Sure. Well, you know, um, Leo the Thirteenth, um, you know, the granddaddy of all social encyclicals is Rerum Novarum, um, on, on the working class or on new things or something like that. And he really writes it, um, I mean, you got to imagine it's the late 19th century. Um, a lot of the working class have been become attracted to uh, Marxism in the 19th century. Uh, Marxism is a materialistic uh, philosophy and, and uh, hostile to, uh, to, the, to the church. And uh, so he needed, he felt the real need that none of the other encyclicals had really addressed what you might want to call economic issues. So he really felt the need to write something that did. And um, he really addresses both the responsibilities, the rights and the responsibilities of, uh, if you want to borrow Marx's categories, you know, the workers and the owners or something like that. And, um, and so he really tries to lay out what, what the rights of those groups are, but also what the responsibilities are. And, um, and so, for example, he defends um, the right to private property, right? So in private ownership of the means of production, I'm sounding like such a Marxist here. Um, but uh, so, for example, if you, if you study Marx, you know, Marx is, it, it proposes the state ownership of the means of production, right? But so the, uh, the encyclical, part of it defends the rights of private ownership, right? And that right arises from my responsibilities, right? There's, in Catholic social teaching, there's, there's rights are always tied to responsibilities, right? Not, and, and that rights don't give you responsibilities, responsibilities give you rights, okay? And because of the, the person's responsibility to their family and providing for their family, private ownership is a good thing, right? And so he, he rejects the notion of, of trying to do away with private ownership and replace it with some sort of notion of uh, social ownership or something like that. Um, at the same time, he recognizes and argues that there is a moral obligation, uh, the worker has a moral obligation to do his job well and, and all that, but the, the, the onus really falls more on the employer to um, pay a just wage, um, to not overwork their, you know, to, to have working, uh, decent working hours. Um, he's, he speaks in opposition to child labor, um, things like that. So it's, it's really the first encyclical that speaks to economic issues and recognizes the importance of trying to create a more just economic system. Right. And that really kind of lays the groundwork for the social encyclicals that follow. So just about every pope since Leo has written at least one what's considered a social encyclical. And, um, and so they all kind of build on that. So the next important one, should I just keep going a little bit, is Quadrigissimo Anno, which was Pius XI. In, um, I don't want to say 1931, it's the 40th anniversary of Rium de Varum, Quadrigissimo, 40th anniversary, just as John Paul II writes Centissimus on it, on the 100th anniversary of Rium de Varum. So they're always dialoguing back to Rium de Varum. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, again, that takes up even more specifically um, economic issues. So Pius is very concerned. He writes that at the beginning of the Great Depression, um, really looking at the... Um, <laughs> sort of the dangers of a system that seems to put profit above people and um, really emphasizing, um, and again, you get much, much even greater emphasis on the, on the notion of a just wage, right? A just wage being a wage that um, a breadwinner can support his family on, okay? And that that, uh, so again, one of the things that's kind of um, unpopular about the just wage is, depending on what your responsibilities are, you're, you're your pay would be different, <laughs> you know? I mean, I remember, quick aside, I remember when I was teaching at Mount St. Mary's, and uh, some of you may be familiar with, um, uh, gosh, what was this, the fellow's name? He was a Catholic theologian. I'm blanking on his Oh, Miller? No, no. Anyhow, he gets up at a faculty meeting and says, I think we have to employ the just wage here, which is 
if you know, depending on how many kids you have and things like that, that will determine your salary, right? And we've got to apply this across the boards to the faculty, to the staff, to the grounds crew, to everybody. And people went nuts, you know. And this, I remember this one friend of mine in economics stands up and says, "You're telling me you're going to pay me less because that guy got married and has kids, you know? No, equal pay, equal work is." The mantra, right? But just wages, no, what your responsibilities are determine your wage, but your wage has to be the family wage, right? That you can support your wife and kids on this, or if it's the wife that's working, can support the husbands and kids on this. And wages have to be, um, have to, you know, that is what is just, that is what is due to the worker. Trying to abuse that is um, a grave, uh, grave sin. Does that sort of get to it? Yeah. By the way, you have our permission to go off and, oh. and, <laughs> okay, and tell sorry. stories and... <laughs> right, um, yeah. <clears throat> Beautiful. Um, what do you think Dorothy Day saw as her biggest, as the, the biggest need within society mm. and then separately within the church? Oh, boy. Um, let's take the first part first. And they probably are related. One of the things that was a big takeaway for me when I started really reading Dorothy Day and thinking about Dorothy Day right, was the notion of personal responsibility. Okay? And what I mean by that is not the sort of libertarian notion that you should just be responsible for yourself, but my personal, personal responsibility for the other. Okay? And I think that she saw that one of the, the thing, the, one of the bad things that she saw happening in society was we kept getting more and more comfortable with the idea that the poor were somebody else's responsibility, right? and that the poor were the state's responsibility. Okay? And so we kind of divorced ourselves from personal responsibility for people. And she said, you know, um, big uh, you know, places that are, you know, housing the homeless or you know, these institution, institutional places and on that are really a sign of the failure of Christianity. Right? That real Christians really have to take personal responsibility. And I think that's a real challenge and it's one of the things I find most challenging about her. So I think in terms of when she looked at society, that was, that was one of the great failures that we were really failing to take personal responsibility for the other found it easier to let somebody else take care of them. In terms of the church, um, it could be the same. <laughs> you know? um, I mean, she was very, um, she was very uncomfortable with the church not living up to the Gospels. You know? um, she didn't like clericalism. She didn't like um, wealth and, you know, the church sort of, you know, um, things like they were sort of what she thought was ostentatious aspects of it. So I think those are kind of kind of tied together. But that that's, that's probably was her biggest beef. I mean, she was very you know, I mean, she was very faithful to the teachings of the church. But she could clearly see when church members didn't embrace those teachings or embrace things that she thought were counter to those teachings. I mean, in the 1960s. She was very uncomfortable with what she saw as the church's sort of uh, too friendly relationship with the military industrial complex and things like that. Um, when I first got to this parish, someone came up to me and just and said, just so you know, I hate clericalism. <laughs> and I said, well, I hate clericalism too. <laughs> <laughs> You'll find me to make people who say they like it, though I know a few people who practice it. <laughs> um, could you give just a brief definition of clericalism from the point of the laity? Ooh, from the point of the laity. Uh, nothing's too good for father. Um, <laughs> um, it's, I think it is when the priests um, sort of view the laity as um, fail to recognize the uh, the talents, the abilities um, of the laity sort of fail to um, sort of respond to the needs of the laity. Um, I think that some of, you know, I'm, I, I don't know, I wanna, don't want to get, I want to start talking out of school. <laughs> sure. 
Um, and even just... How would you define clerical? I, I think I would add a, a, a culture which states that, that, that father is automatically better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. More dignified. It's true that, that the priesthood is a supernatural vocation. It's, um, that it's lifted out of, out of the natural by way of a call towards celibacy, by way of even the celebration of the sacraments. But I look, and you've probably heard this in my homilies, if, if you were not here, I would look very silly, living a priestly life without the laity. And so part of it is the beautiful, what, what, what Shapu used to call the interpenetration of the um, vocations of the laity, the religious life, the consecrated single life, uh, life of holy matrimony, and the clergy. And I would even add... Um, we are we as clerics are forbidden to run for public office um, because we part part of our call as clerics is to preserve the teaching and the unity within the life of the church but in terms of what the tax rate should be how Colorado deals with the homeless that the temporal governance of um, of secular life is for the laity and so we proclaim um, Right, the right, the absolute right to life, and the preeminence of that teaching, and then how that gets implemented, isn't for necessarily the church to dictate how, and so it can even be this just all-engrossing. Father knows everything. Um, father calls all the shots, um, and then an air of right, nothing's too good for father. And I think if you go back to social encyclicals, I mean, clearly they are not laying out specific economic policy. You know, that's never what they saw themselves doing. What they're laying out are the principles that any economic policy needs to follow if it's really going to serve human needs. Right? And so, you know, you don't go in there looking for them to tell you, you know, an economic theory. Beautiful. <clears throat> All right, another conjecture question. Mm. Um, what do you think Dorothy Day would think about the, uni the idea of universal basic income? Universal basic income meaning technology is slowly taking away all jobs and, and pretty much we're just going to need a check that comes from the government for basic sustenance and then any work uh, on the side, but that we're going to work ourselves out of human jobs and so therefore there, everybody is entitled to a, a universal and a basic level of income. Well, I don't, I mean, obviously that's something she never would have spoken to. Um, you know, again for her that would, that would look a lot like big government doing everything, um, to be honest with you. I think that is what she would think. Um, yeah, she advocated for voluntary poverty, which um, is, you know, I, I admire it, but, you know, I, I obviously don't practice it. Um, you know, so, I mean, what she th would think would be necessary would seem not very much to most of us in our hyper-consumer society, right? But she really, uh, she talks about what she calls Holy Mother the State, you know, where people just think that, you know, that the state just becomes the force that drives everything and does everything. And so I think... The idea that the state was again going to take over this other aspect, I think that again for her would just somehow be removing my personal responsibility. Yeah. But that's again that's speculation. I just it's a gut reaction. Are you following the um, kind of the riots going on in France right now of moving the <laughs> age of retirement from 62 to 64? Mm -hmm. Great. Elisa has a question for us. What can we do today as a community to continue in our own small way the moral legacy that Dorothy Day left us? And yeah. How, how would you even define the term moral legacy? Well, um, how would I define the term moral legacy? I mean, she does leave a moral legacy. She, she gives us, you know, she's such a witness. She's such a, I mean, um, I mean that's what first attracted me to her. Um, she's just such an incredible witness of, of the Catholic faith and, and, and the Catholic um, life. So, um, you know, um, I mean, I think that, I don't, I can't say there's one thing. So what, read me the first part again. How can, what can we do today as a community 
to continue in our own small way the moral legacy that Dorothy Day left us? Yeah, um, I mean, the most obvious thing is you see, you know, I mean, the, 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 problem, the problems of the poor and the homeless have not gone away, okay, and there's clearly probably room to, to work there. But, you know, there are also, um, you know, other problems. And I guess, you know, trying to figure out how to serve the community is not a one-size-fits-all. Different communities have different needs. Um, but sort of looking at, you know, what are the needs of this community and what can we do to, uh, to address those is what I would, uh, I think we would, we would look at. You know, um, Peter Marin talks about, says, Peter Marin was the co-founder with Dorothy Day, and um, he says, you know, every parish should have a house of hospitality, okay, to serve the, the poor and the homeless in that parish. Um, you know, and I, I think that there's, you know, truth to that, but it's also the case that there are some parishes where that would, that's not the, the most pressing need. You know, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's serving the elderly, or maybe it's uh, helping, you know, single mothers. Or, you know, I, mean, it's just, I think you have to look at what the, what the need is. You know, there's a lot out there. Lisa, did you have a thought on that one? Great. Um, Mike offers a question. Dorothy Day said on page 89, I have not wanted to challenge the church, not on any of its doctrinal positions. As we ourselves try to form a well-formed conscience, how can we, the laity, determine which positions of the church are doctrinal versus which positions of the church are non not expressly doctrinal. Gosh, Father, I would let you answer that better than me. Yeah. Um, I, I think for one, uh, there are specific gradations of teaching within the life of the church. When, when the Holy Father proclaims something de fide that we believe and hold uh, with Catholic faith, theological things such as... Um, the perpetual virginity of Mary, or um, the Immaculate Conception, or um, the impeccability of Jesus, namely that he himself never sinned. Um, those would be things that um, find their roots in Scripture, but it doesn't say, you know, Luke 10.42, Jesus never sinned, right? Um, and so there are specific teachings that the church offers as an unfolding of what we call the deposit of faith, the deposit of faith would be the writings uh, of sacred scripture that ended with the death of the last apostle. And then from that, you have um, teachings that come from, so the early church starts to kind of work out, well, who, ag who exactly was Jesus? Those who had no living memory of who Jesus was, what does it mean that he walked on water? But what does it also mean that he grew in learning and understanding and wisdom and was obedient to his parents. And so you, had, you have problems within every uh, era and genre of the church in which we're working out both who is God, what is he about, and what is he asking of us. Then you have something that would be more in the moral realm that would be um, like the 1931 teaching that comes from um, a document called Casti e Canubi on chaste wedlock, on chaste uh, holy matrimony, which would be a response to the Episcopalians in the Lambeth Conference that said uh, contraception is okay. And you have the church making a definitive proclamation, the Catholic Church, saying we don't believe that you can separate the... Um, the reproductive nature of sexuality with uh, the amorous or the desirous um, nature. And so that there's an element of sacrifice that goes with an element of desire, and those two remain together. Now, that doesn't mean you always have to bring forth life <clears throat> in every sexual act, but the openness to life would have been prescribed uh, definitively since 1931 and has remained unchanged. Uh, and then all the more with Humanae Vitae in 1965. So those would be definitive teachings and examples of them. I'd say the easiest place is the Catechism, which, was, which came out in 1992, 
uh, as John Paul II offering how do we find an easy amalgamation of what the church teaches and asks us to hold. Now, um, I, I, I think I'd, I'd restate this question to you this way. Um, how do you wrestle with uh, teachings in the church that, that you personally, not you personally, but one personally, um, would have either have a hard time with or doesn't understand on first pass? How do you go about the um, personal disagreement and discernment of what the church asks of me? Let's take something more like um, right, the universal destination of goods and, and probably that we all all of us here probably own more than even the church would ask us to. Right. Oh, good. Well, that's more of a softball. I thought yeah. you were so how, so, how, <laughs> so how, how do you wrestle with right. things that are... Um, well, there, I mean, because there, there is a... Ten, and the church recognizes the tension in the universal destination of goods is that God created everything for everybody, right? Um, and the notion of private property and how do you reconcile those two notions because the church embraces both of them, right? But there is a sense in which the universal destination of goods is a higher good, um, private property, such that when I start to amass private property at the expense of others, right, um, then I've started to um, abuse the, the right of private property, right? So, um, you know, and I think that's something um, Dorothy Day would have um, been very comfortable with, that she, you know, um, again, uh, you know, the coat in your closet belongs to the poor, um, that, you know, you don't need a bunch of stuff, you know? <laughs> and, you know, we just live in such a hyper-consumer culture that, you know, we're convinced that we do. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if that kind of speaks to that. Let's, let's take one step more definitive, right? The church has, has always proclaimed the preeminent teaching of the right to life. Without life, one can't be saved from poverty. One can't be fought for racial equality, things like that. And at the same time, we're in a society that's very um, nervous about that because we hear, we might from our own experiences hear, um, we're pro-baby but not pro-woman, or we're pro, um, uh, yeah, a certain element of misogyny. So how would, how would again, the impersonal you, um, how would one go about like personally wrestling uh, with that a lot more definitive and clear teaching of the church, even if, it, they, if one finds it abrasive? Well, um, I mean, some of that is, is if you, I, I, there's this, I have a discussion there of the development of conscience, right? And, um, and, I, and I talk about how, you know, we kind of mistake, I'm trying to see if I can find it real quick. Uh, um, I'm on page like 82 and 83. Um, and, so I say, and I say at the bottom of, so it talks about the importance of a, of a well-formed conscience. Um, so it's quoting the catechism there, um, or actually Gaudium, Gaudium and Spes. Um, it says, in the depths of his conscience, man detects a law which he has not laid upon himself, but which holds him in obedience. For man has a heart, in, it, Man has in his heart a law written by God, right? So the conscience is not a law that I lay upon myself, right? It's the discernment of, um, of the natural law, the God's law, right? Um, and so the further down that page near the bottom, he says, that the goal of conscience is to discern the truth so as to be guided by an objective standard of moral conduct, right? So conscience, a well-formed conscience will... <laughs> Um, I have, I'll give an example of day, from this from day, is, um, is that you're looking for an objective standard, right? not a subjective standard, that church doesn't understand conscience as a subjective standard. Right? That is to say, conscience is not in itself the authority, but rather the truth is the authority the conscience seeks to understand. Conscience should not be misunderstood as a feeling that has, one has about moral issues or a justification for the claim that moral law is relative to each individual. 
as John Paul II observed, the conscience, therefore, is not an independent, exclusive capacity to decide what is good and what is evil. Right? So the, the conscience is an aspect of, of reason. Right? It's not some sort of subjective feeling. It's an aspect of reason. And it's not infallible. Right? No reason isn't infallible. Nothing human is infallible. Right? So, um, so the, the notion of a well-formed conscience is to really try to understand um, the church's teaching on this and why it holds these positions, right? And then, um, and then really trying to discern what would be the universal objective moral law, okay? Not some sort of subjective um, notion, right? And I think, you know, I, and I don't explore it too much, but the thing I wrestle with the most in Dorothy Day is her pacifism. I find pacifism a real challenge, okay? Because I'm, I can, I, 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 you know, I can understand, um, you know, condemning violence and so on and so forth, but I, I have to admit there are sometimes, I think, situations calls for the use of force, right? And, um, and so I, I wrestle with that. And I really think that, you know, if there's one place that she dissents from the Catholic teaching, it's on just war theory, right? And I talk about that in the pacifism chapter. But basically, I really think that she came to the conclusion that war was objectively morally wrong, okay? And that that is, um, and, and that a Christian was just called to, to reject it, right? And so that um, the use of violence is objectively morally wrong. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's an example where even though the church m holds to a position which is just war theory, which says that in certain circumstances, under certain conditions, force is um, justified, I think that she, um, she didn't hold that. Now, the way I sometimes try to, I've been thinking about this a lot, sometimes I try to pull her out of that is that, well, she doesn't write, the, the, the principle of just war theory is that uh, governments have the right to defend themselves and countries have a right to defend themselves and so on and so forth. And I think that you could say that she could agree with that, but the way you defend yourself for her really was what she would call the weapons of the spirit. Um, it's what Jacques Maritain calls the weapons our enemies don't have. Prayer, the mass, fasting, things short of violence. Okay? So, um, so she would, you know, she, it's not like she would think, oh, what that person is doing is just. No, she may think it's unjust, but how am I going to oppose that? I'm not going to oppose that with force. I'm not going to oppose that with violence. I'm going to oppose it with, with prayer. Um, and sacrifice. So, um, you know, she's not endorsing, you know, she's not saying that other people, the, the, there aren't injustices, but she's, the, the question is more how do I respond to those injustices? And I really think that she arrived at that through, um, it's something that develops over the course of her, uh, her, her thinking, and I think she really does arrive at the claim that violence is morally, um, objectively morally wrong. Mm. Beautiful. But, yeah, I don't know, but that would be my our, example. Our speaking on conscience um, brings to mind uh, a, f a fairly straightforward and at the same time perplexing uh, quote from our Lord. This is Luke. Um, this is Luke chapter twelve, uh, and after having told a parable uh, of the master being delayed in coming back and seeing his servants. It says, that servant who knew his master's will but did not make preparations, nor act in accord with his will, shall be beaten severely. Okay, that one kind of makes sense. And the servant who was ignorant of his master's will but acted in a way deserving of a severe beating shall be beaten only slightly. <laughs> so I don't know, two spankings versus 12, whatever it is. But, but to me, it speaks of what you're talking about in terms of the, the one, one can't just claim ignorance and say, therefore, I don't, like, I don't deserve any punishment. And it's not that we hold, right? The beauty of our Catholic faith is we allow the judgment, uh, punishment, the notion of heaven and hell. That's all Jesus is. He's given us the ordinary means of salvation. Um, but if we act not in accord with what God has expressly, expressly taught or desired or given through his church. Um, and then even ignorance is no way out of that. And so actually in part, uh, as we read, as we study in the faith, it 
act, it continuously makes us both more virtuous and more culpable when we don't live up to the call. But ignorance is no way out either. And so it's a beautiful kind of conundrum, which is why our faith is not just about study. It's not just about learning more. It's not just a Gnostic tradition whereby you keep learning these secrets. Because as we learn, we're drawn into deeper relationship. And the Holy Spirit, the gift of God, the advocate, the consoler, the comforter, the fortifier is given to us to live up to the higher call that we've discovered in our study and our teaching. That one Sunday where we hear that one line from the one gospel and it hits us in a very particular way and realizes, oh, I need to go beyond my current state. And so it's the beautiful interplay of, of conscience, not just in a vacuum, but illuminated by the light of the Holy Spirit, illuminated by living communally, right? And especially in a parochial setting um, that you and I might be a people a noble of a noble mission um, and enlivened to be able to live the truths of the gospel. Uh, any, as you often say, any questions or problems with that? <laughs> uh, does anyone have, <clears throat> this would be a great interjection point, otherwise we can keep going through our questions, but if anyone has a thought to share or a question based on something that we've come up with so far. Everybody's decision in those areas you're talking about depends on where they are in their faith, where they are in their knowledge, understanding, and status in life. And that changes almost, I'd say hourly, but daily, monthly, whatever. Who makes the decision of the person right or wrong? Is he constantly changing it? Who makes the decision if the person is right or wrong? Is it just the person's decision? His understanding at the time, given what he's... Well, then that would just make it subjective, uh, yeah. right? Um, that's clearly not what the church teaches, right? That, and what conscience is trying to discern <laughs> is the objective moral truth, right? And so um, just because you want this to be true or you think that it doesn't necessarily mean that it is, right? So part of the formation that we're called to, our moral formation, is the discernment of the, of the, um, of the moral truth. Now, if you go back in the, you know, the Catholic tradition, that's at least partly going to be grounded in, it's grounded in, the, in revelation, but it's also grounded in the moral law, uh, the, the eternal law, which we understand as the natural law. Right? which is reason's ability, which is always finite and always um, fallible to understand God's moral law. And to go into what you said a little bit more, so objectively speaking, things are right or wrong. Nobody determines who's right or what's right or wrong. That's objectively given from God. But I think who determines hints at a subjective notion, which would be how culpable, how blameworthy um, would someone be in, in, if they chose something wrong and then didn't necessarily know that it was wrong or kind of knew but not fully or totally knew, right? Um, when you were raising kids, <clears throat> you might have said, okay, we're going, um, your mom and I are going out listen to the babysitter. But you didn't give this litany of everything else of like, please don't go into the pantry and eat all the Oreos. And please don't go into mom and dad's underwear drawer. And please don't, right? You didn't give a list because it was kind of presumed that, yeah. that there's a certain way of acting and it, con it falls in, in with, every, with the regular culture that you've established, right? Um, the old law, of the Old Testament had 613 commandments. Then, kind of preserving the Ten Commandments, Jesus gives two more. Um, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Great. How do I love God and love neighbor in the world with the internet? Right? The first time a child sees internet pornography, it's both exciting, exhilarating, weird, shame-filled. 
and probably the first time it's it's not even their fault they either stumble on it someone sends them a link someone initiates them to it or they fall into it themselves and then at what point might the child realize oh this isn't good for me this teaches me something about others that is a lie about who they are and so someone can grow an increasing culpability as they realize oh this isn't good and then if one more freely chooses it then it's always been objectively wrong the first exposure was not blameworthy at all because that's just a casualty of living in the 21st century but there's this slow pedagogy that our lord does with us through our conscience through community through good parents through a whole number of things uh, and, and pornography is just the easiest example, but there's, there's, this applies to nearly everything, that everything that's objectively wrong also has, well, how, how, how much was your will freely involved? I mean, these are the three um, ingredients of a mortal sin. Full knowledge. Did you know it was wrong or not? Full consent. How was there an element of addiction? Was there an element of unfreedom? Was it more of a reaction than a choice? Um, and then how grave is something? So I would, I would kind of take that question in that direction as well. Beautiful, thank you for that question. Anything else? Great, Elisa, uh, she's our only one who has submitted two questions thus far. Good job. All right. Uh, she also says, in one of the first chapters of the book, it's written that Dorothy Day was attending the Episcopal Church in the beginning of her life. Why do you think did she decide to abandon that faith or to, um, to move from that faith? Uh, and why did she choose the Catholic faith? Or maybe what did she see in the Catholic faith that made her um, move from the faith of her upbringing into, into the Catholic yeah. faith? Um, that's a good question. I mean, what happens is her, neither of her parents were religious at all, and so she really was raised in a very non-religious environment. When she was about 12 or 13, she became friends with a girl whose parents were very um, faithful Episcopalians, and so they convinced Dorothy's parents to have her baptized in the Episcopal Church, and so she was baptized Christian. Um, and she, I think, you know, was interested in it for a while, but by the time she got to university, um, she went to the University of Illinois at Urbana. By the time she got there, she was really an atheist. She really didn't see herself as anything, you know. And she saw, um, you know, religion was just the opiate of the masses, and she was just kind of accepting that view. Um, she. Her experience through having an abortion, having a failed marriage, um, having a common law marriage, and then finding herself pregnant again um, really brought her back to God, okay, if not specifically Catholicism. But um, Catholicism had been sort of calling to her in different ways even prior to that. Um, you know, after um, she was living for a while in New Orleans and she started to attend benediction and things like that. So I think there were just, there was something that was calling to her in the, in the Catholic faith and in the, the rites of the Catholic Church that she found calling to her. So when she, um, when she decided that she would have her daughter Tamar baptized, um, <coughs> she, she, she she was trying to figure out what to do, and there's a, the story is, you know, she runs into this nun on the beach who tells her, I want to have my child baptized, and the nun says, of course you do, um, and she's going to get her baptized Catholic, right? But the nun says to her, you know, you can't be not Catholic and raise your daughter Catholic, and, you know, and really starts to show her that she needs to also enter the church. So about a year after her daughter's baptism, you know, she enters the church. So I think she felt called to the Catholic faith and different ways, right? And, um, and so, you know, her, but, you know, she, I mean, her, what do you call it when somebody's already baptized so you don't have to rebaptize them, you just, uh, uh, it's a technical term. Supplied, but. right? You receive them? I mean, yeah, something like that. She's received, I mean, she didn't have to be baptized again, but she was an ordained, or an ordained, but she was, uh, had first. Oh, so comes into was, full communion. Comes into full communion, all has the other sac sacraments of initiation and so on and so forth, right? But, um, you know, so that was just, 
um, just where she felt she was being drawn to. I don't really know if there's a explanation other than that. Okay. Beautiful. Um, Socorro asks, uh, was Dorothy Day involved with and or supportive of the civil rights movement? Oh, yeah. Um, and does that have anything to do with the relatively low number of black Catholics in this country? Um, she was supportive of it. Uh, gosh, I mean, yeah, there, I mean, the Catholic Church does not have a great record for being welcoming to black people. Um, you know, that's um, uh, Gloria, who's the woman who, um, what's her name? Oh, she's the new one. Yeah, so. But anyhow, there's. Um, but they um, actually, you know, was was supportive of the of the civil rights movement, and um, she was. I mean, she would. She was at some rallies down south and all that. I think she got shot at once down there. Um, but the you know the Catholic worker, for example, the Catholic worker in Baltimore, um, this the city shut it down, um, the Catholic worker house because it was integrated right, back in the 1940s or whatever. It had black men and white men living in the same building. And so it was shut down, and she strongly protested against that. Right? So I think there was a certain, um, she, you know, she was clearly on board with uh, the civil rights um, agenda, um, and also the agenda of um, the rights of, of um, you know, immigrants and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, that was part of, part of what she was doing. I don't think she had the ready answer as to why the Catholic Church has kind of not been as welcoming as it needs to be. Yeah. One of our initiatives in the school that we're working on is uh, an eighth grade trip to Washington, D.C. with the whole class, but choosing to use public transportation on the metro. Um, because there you get a glimpse that, oh, like when you hear George Floyd and things like that, well, when you're growing up as a teenager in South Denver, Colorado, um, we live in a section that's about as white as Wonder Bread. And uh, for, them, for these eighth graders to see that there's actually, ra both racial diversity is, is a good and beautiful thing, but just the ability to, to, to accept people, regardless of skin tone, but even to, so that they might realize that the rest of the world is not as white as we might find ourselves in our own little pockets and bubbles. Um, actually jumping on that, I don't know if you can comment on kind of a hundred years ago, this country had national churches. So, and you probably remember this either from your grandparents or whatever. There are, there's the Polish church and then the Irish church and then the Lithuanian, whatever. And, and never the twain shall meet. And they were both going to compete as to which one had the better Jesus or the taller Joseph or the, the better roof or whatever it is. Um, and, and then I think we were moving out of that ethos of, of both Catholicism, but then Catholicism by my, um, my own bloodline. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any comment on that movement in this nation? Uh, well, I mean, I, I mean, yeah, my... my my parent, my grandparents, um, my grandfather was from Poland and my grandmother was, um, was Slovak. And those churches were still, you know, and this was in central Pennsylvania. I mean, that's sort of, they, they were, nat the churches had that nationality and the, you know, the bulletin was in Polish and things like that, you know. Um, so that was clearly, you know, we were even divided among ourselves in that way. I think that's somewhat disappeared. Um, I mean, I think we still see it, and I mean, for good or for ill, I mean, splits between sort of uh, Hispanic churches and Anglo churches, mm -hmm. okay? and um, I think there's still that sort of tension uh, that we still work with, but that's, that's the more obvious one in, in <coughs> you know, today's, Beautiful. our culture. Yeah. Um, a quote from your book, oh. all Christians are called to be hospitable. But it is more, a uh, quote from your book, quoting Dorothy Day, all Christians are called to be hospitable, but it is more than serving a meal or filling a bed, opening a door. It is to open ourselves, our hearts, to the needs of others. Hospitality is not just shelter, but the quality of welcome behind it. Mm -hmm. Can you identify 
at least one, a false form of generosity mm. Mm. and why its consequences would be unsatisfactory to the call of the Christian? Mm. Well, um, gosh, I don't know. That's a tough question. Um, it's clearly the case that hospitality has to include the recognition of the value of the, of the person, right? And, that the, and we also have to recognize that persons are um, spiritual and material, okay? And so when she does, talks about the works of mercy, I mean, there's the spiritual works and there's the corporeal works for that reason, right? And that um, when we're trying to serve somebody, it's not enough to just serve one aspect of them and not the other, right? We've got to serve the whole person, right? And again, it comes back to sort of the notion of personal responsibility. When we turn response, that responsibility over to an institution like the state, um, the state is, that can't serve the spiritual needs of the people. I mean, it's not designed to, I don't really want it to. You know, I don't want Donald Trump as my spiritual director. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or Joe Biden, for that matter. So the church, that's not what the state can do, but that means that the state really can't serve people because people are body and spirit. Right? So when we serve others, we have to look beyond just serving them spiritually, materially, which is sometimes the easiest thing to do, you know, give them a sandwich or something like that, but to try to you know, engage them and, and speak to them about, you know, and so, you know, one of the spiritual works of mercy, uh, counseling the doubtful, uh, admonishing the sinner, you know, okay, they're all in there, they're yeah. listed somewhere, <laughs> you know. So I think um, that's sort of what we're called to beyond, you know, hospitality has to be a real, com a more complete thing. It's hard, I mean, I mean, I think that, you know, that's one of the things that, I've, that first kind of brought me up short when I was reading Day. She has a piece, uh, it's in her, if you're looking for a good anthology of her writing, it's just called Dorothy Day Selected Writings, and there's a piece in there called Room for Christ, which I think was first in the Catholic Worker newspaper, but I'm not absolutely certain. But it's really where she really says, um, the other doesn't just you know, represent Christ, the other really is Christ, right? And you have to welcome Christ in, you know? And that's a real challenge. I remember the first time I read that, um, being really kind of taken back by that and realizing that really is what we're called to do. And, um, and so, you know, that sort of, you know, and that gets back to the notion of the, uh, of the mystical body of Christ. You know, we're all members, of, as you always like to say, we're all members or potential members of the mystical body of Christ so that those people who are there in front of us are we have a responsibility to them as a part of ourselves. And so that hospitality just has to extend to, to that. I don't know. Great. I wish I did. You know, I'm not very good at that, but I can give you the theory. No, but that also goes to your, at the beginning, speaking of Marxism, of just being purely material. Right. And, um, and that if we, even as a church, have a purely material response, here's a bologna sandwich, here's all the granola bars you could ever need, we actually still fail them. Right. right. I was talking to somebody who was involved in um, Christ in the City. Who was that? Um, I mean, I think Christ in the City is a good example of where they're really trying to um, serve people on a deeper level than just giving them a bologna sandwich. I mean, I, I really respect the missionaries that, that do that work because it's really about hospitality and entering into a relationship. Did anyone here come to our, we had a presentation on the human element of homelessness, which was a three-part presentation, one of which was the um, Christ in the City. A few of you were here. Um, can you give us a reading rain rainbow movement of another book, which I have yet to read, but I remember very distinctly you giving uh, a really awesome intro to the book called uh, Fear of Beggars. Oh, okay. Fear of Beggars is a really interesting book um, by a woman named, her last name is Kelly. Can you give me, can you look that up real quick for me? I don't know what her title is. She teaches at uh, the University of Dayton. She has a great line. She says, the opposite of poverty is not uh, plenty. The opposite of poverty is, is friendship. Um, 
Kelly Johnson. Kelly Johnson, that's her name. Can you say that line again? Uh, the opposite of, of poverty is not plenty. The opposite of poverty is friendship, she says. But it's called Fear of Beggars. And it really sort of, it's, it, it's a sort of a history in which it says, you know, there was a certain point, and it's somewhere around the Reformation, where beggars became criminal. <laughs> Um, you know, because like if you think of the mendicants, like St. Francis of Assisi or, or somewhere, the Dominican, Dominicans, yeah. Um, these mendicant orders, you know, begging was seen as, as you know, a, a way of, be, of a, a level of spirituality and, a, and a something that I was, and I had a responsibility for them. Um, it's sort of interesting that she kind of takes on the notion of how in the, early modern period, 15th, 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, you get this whole other view of um, that God, that somehow my wealth is an indication I'm blessed by God rather than my poverty. Right? And so um, you get you know, the, the gospel of, of wealth, <laughs> that uh, you know, a sign that you are ple pleasing to God is that you have a lot of money. And, and so beggars obviously aren't, right? And so we get that whole shift to a whole other way of seeing beggars in this sort of, uh, the, the, the undeserving poor, you know, they don't deserve anything because it's their own damn fault. And, um, and, so, we, she's, and so her book just kind of argues, using Peter Marin actually quite a bit, argues for sort of recovering um, to get beyond the sphere of beggars and trying to figure out how we can help them, you know, really be hospitable to them. Yeah. Good book. Interesting. Can you also quote the Shaphu story that sometimes you quote? Which one? The, um, <laughs> the one about hell. Oh, I don't know if I... Oh, oh maybe it's not you. Maybe I thought it's it was not me. It might be me. I'm getting Shaphu old often too. used to say, um, and he would say this when he was at donor dinners, um, and he would say, the, the, poor, the poor need you um, to stay off the streets or something like that, and you need the poor to stay out of hell. And this notion of, right, for those that live out of excess, that actually your salvation comes by way of giving what you truly, right, the, the, fifth through the 28th coat in your closet, <laughs> however many pairs of shoes, however many zeros in your bank account that are beyond what you need. So maybe that wasn't you, but it's a, it's a story that often gets <laughs> told that, you know, and if you remember Shapu, that guy had a lot of gumption. Yeah. Um, but again, this is, this is the truth with the strength at which Jesus often presented it. Yeah, I mean, he was a cabbage. He was a cabbage. <laughs> yeah, he probably lived it, so... Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the impacts that they had on me personally was a sort of uh, simplification of my life. You know, I, I, you know, voluntary poverty is pretty much a bridge too far for me. I, I, I think about it, but and it's hard when you have kids, and it's hard when um, and and you know, uh, but um, a sort of simplifying. You know, I mean. We live in such, I have a talk that I give sometimes to some parishes if they ask called Consuming Like a Catholic. And there's really an excellent book I love called Being Consumed. And it's called uh, Economics and Christian Desire by um, William, uh, what's his name? Teaches it to sound. It teaches it to. Um, it's, a, it's a book called um, Being Consumed. Uh, the subtitle is. Um, Economics and Christian Desire. William T. Kavanaugh. Right, William T. Kavanaugh, who's a Catholic theologian. But he's, he, I, I, this book is about 100 pages. It's really good. But he's, the question he really asks is, as a Catholic, what's the most important thing we consume? The Eucharist. The Eucharist. Okay. And if that's the most important, then the, the Eucharist really should be the model for all the rest of our consumption. Right? So the question you want to ask is, in consuming this, does it bring me closer to God and does it bring me closer to others? Right? And if it's not doing that, then um, we have to see if that's really what we need to be consuming. 
right? So, I mean, one of the, so they really kind of brought me to, uh, you know, a certain simplicity, you know, I don't, you don't need a lot of stuff. Trying to consume, uh, well, you guys read the chapter on um, distributist, you know, trying to consume locally and, um, and, you know, to have that direct sort of economic impact in your communities. Um, trying not to consume in a way that is, that separates me from others or that exploits others, right? And that's hard to do in a global economy. But really thinking about um, where does this come from and how is it, you know, why is it so damn cheap? <laughs> you know? um, and those are questions that, you know, I think Catholics could be asking themselves. Um, it's, you know, and so I, she really has pushed me to at least evaluate that aspect of things. Right? And, um, you know, I, like I said, I think for me, uh, I, you know, I'm just not very good, but voluntary poverty for me is just a, really is just a bridge too far. I just can't get myself to that level of, uh, you know, where I have nothing other than just the basics, you know, I'm just, I'm spoiled. But, you know. Um, and with the notion that, right, Jesus doesn't go up to everyone and says, sell everything you have and come and follow me. So there's, there's, you know, we sort of I think <laughs> there's, there's, there's gradations, at least right. simplicity of life, I think. Is would, achieve, more achievable. Is, is, so you how know. would you characterize voluntary poverty? How do you characterize these three things? Simplicity of life, voluntary poverty, and destitution, like recklessness. Uh, well, destitution, I mean, she makes a distinction between voluntary poverty and destitution. I mean, destitution is when you really have nothing, right? And you really have no way of, um, of satisfying your basic needs, right? Voluntary poverty, I mean, in the, the way she lived it was that she lived at the same level as everybody who was a guest in the house of hospitality, and they lived off the donations that came in, which meant that sometimes she paid her bills and sometimes she didn't. Um, but, you know, voluntary poverty is really, you know, a living with the sort of minimum the coat in your closet belongs to the poor, um, and really, you know, making sure that there is, you know, no excess and no nothing My, I don't know. I mean, I think I have, I have, a, I have a. Let me see if I have a definition of it in here real quick. Uh, I mean, she's talking about Saint Francis. Um, yeah, I mean, she just thought that poverty brings us into a, a much closer relationship with the poor, right? And trying to live that life as closely as we can with them. Um, yeah, I mean, just, there's a little bit of discussion of that on like 75 and 76. Right. Um, <coughs> I think simplicity of life is, you know, trying to do with, you know, trying to, you know, live with a sort of minimum of, of necessities, you know, I have a car and things like that, um, or of, of goods. Um, sort of being aware of what I have and where it comes from um, and what is the sort of moral, what is the, what is the moral cost of this, you know. And, um, and so really thinking about that before you just would purchase anything or, or participate in anything, you know. Uh, it's, it's, it's ironic that my book is, you can buy my book through Amazon, but, you know, I, I boycott Amazon. Um, I'm bringing it to its knees. Um, <laughs> my wife and I are boycotting Amazon. They are ready to cave at any moment. Um, because I disagree with their business practices and I disagree with how they treat their workers and I disagree with how they do a lot of other things. So, you know, I'm just, just that sort of refusal to participate in, um, in certain things. Um, it's not easy. I mean, you know, um, I tell people when I talk about um, to do that, like to be a distributist or just even to, to pursue that, it's more expensive and less convenient. It's much more convenient to do one click on Amazon than it is to, you know, go and track down the publisher of a book that I want to, so, you know, I want a book from Fordham University Press. I, you know, Fordham University Press will sell me that book as quickly as Amazon. Well, not quite as quickly. It takes a little more time, you know. But uh, it's going to take you, it's less convenient, and it's more expensive. 
right? I mean, I really, if you buy things that are not made in sweatshops, they are gonna be more expensive. And it's hard to sometimes find things that aren't, you know? So um, some things are easy, some things aren't. But, um, you know, I try to buy things that I think are made by where workers are well paid and stuff like that, um, you know. So that's kind of more of this, I don't know if that's simplicity, but it's at least an awareness of, um, of how do I consume? I mean, consum consumption is just such a huge part of what we do. I, I, see, this, I see this commercial, this is really off the top. There's this commercial I see where this woman's side hustle is selling stuff she no longer wants. And my thing is like, why do you have all that crap to begin with? You know, why, why did you, you know? I mean, but it's just this hyper consumerism. And, um, you know, and, and, and sometimes, you know, and it's hard to always buy things that are expensive. I, I know that, you know, it's, I mean, I have a, sh a shirt called, uh, that comes from a company called from, uh, from dirt to shirt, where they actually, it's, it comes out of like North Carolina, they grow the cotton, they make the material there, it's all made in the United States, it's all made by unionized workers and so on and so forth. And it costs $40 for a t-shirt, okay, yes. But so if you wanna buy a t-shirt, you know, go to Target and you can buy one for, you know, $11 or something like that, right? So clearly not everybody can do that, you know. I mean, if you've got a lot of kids, you can't afford to buy them $40 t-shirts, you can't buy, afford to buy them $200 shoes that are made in, uh, Germany because they're nice shoes but they're gonna outgrow them in six months and you know you yeah. so I, I'm, I'm completely aware that you know my choices can't be everybody's choices right and as a as an old man who has very um, limited tastes and things um, you know it's easier for me you know? but in a world of Chanel and Ralph Lauren and Dior some some can afford forty dollar t shirts, I guess. I work for the church, I can, <laughs> I can afford a forty dollar t shirt. Um I don't have many t shirts. <laughs> nice, yeah. How would you uh, part um I would say part of our there's been certain eras and cultures that have valued um, paler skin to darker skin, in part because having lighter skin showed that you didn't have to work outside. <laughs> that having been said, um, why does the church actually see work as a dignified thing <clears throat> when plenty might say, oh, I don't have to work, or I don't, I retired early, right? We, we kind of live in a culture where we enslave ourselves until we have nothing to do as soon as possible. And, and it's, I think both are miserable. Mm. And so what might the Catholic worldview of work oh, gosh. look like? By the way, while he's thinking about this, I have to say this is really fun for me because he sat in on my oral comprehensive exams way back when. <laughs> And, and so, so now she, he gets and to so, question me. That, so yeah, that, was, that, was, that was only a half an hour. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, gosh, I should have a really good line on this, and I don't. Um, you know, I mean, Dorothy Day, she has a line where she says, you know, you can't separate the body from the soul, and you can't separate Sunday from the west of the week, and so you can't separate man from his work. Um, and so work really is, you know, how we, it's, it's, Ideally, it's supposed to be an expression of myself. It's supposed to be a way in which I come to know myself. Um, and so it can be um, a very, uh, you know, it should be something that I can really take pride in and enjoy. Um, now, some jobs, you know, are never going to do that. And so, you know, um, if I was, uh, when I'm in my really good Marxist mood, I say, well, then you should pay those jobs a lot more and, and give people a lot more free time. Um, but it is the case, you know, that there are, um, it is, the, you know, it is the system that often exploits people to work long hours for low pay doing things that other people don't want to do, right? Um, that said, um, there's a lot to be, you know, I mean, manual labor, um, I, you know, I came out of a very working class uh, family. My grandfather was a coal miner. My father was, worked at a, uh, milk processing plant. Um, you know, there's labors you can do that produce goods that are necessary and important and, um, you know, but, uh, but it's very easy to get exploited. I don't know what the easy answer is. 
Right? And part of it is my son is, works as a bike mechanic now. You know, I sent him to college and now he's a bike mechanic. Um, but he loves working with his hands and he loves doing that. And, you know, I, that's what he wants to do. That's what he's going to do. You know, um, he's, you know he's, he's a very good bike mechanic. Um, so, you know, there's just, you know, I think that finding our work is important. I mean, you know, and, and I mean, I, that's probably one of the most important things is you know, finding your vocation. Not, you know, that's, that's, that's good. I mean, work is not a bad thing. I mean, we were meant to do it. Good. Any questions from the peanut gallery? Um, you, you obviously live in Denver mm -hmm. and around Denver. And so, you know, last, well, last night, uh, all the candidates, or 17 candidates for mayor, uh, were in a, a joint you know, talk, talk. Right, right. Um, everyone, everyone thinks that one of our serious problems is the homeless. And so some of them said, well, I've got an answer to that. Yeah, I'm homeless. There's according to the Denver Post, there's 4,718 4, homeless people on the sidewalks at Denver every night. Okay, so the guy, one of the, one of the premier candidates gets up and says, I've got a program for building 5,000, 5,000 homes for these people, houses, accommodations. It seems to me that um, by the time we get done building the 5,000, for the 5,000 there are 4,780, they're here now. You know, the word has gotten around the rest of the country and Denver Denver is a really good place to be because they have a serious, um, serious program for you know housing us, and this will go on forever and ever and ever. Now, what would uh, Dorothy, uh, what would she say about that? Well, I. Th I think she would say that having a reputation as being a place that is hospitable to the homeless is not a bad reputation to have. Um, I don't think that she thinks that the answer is the state is going to solve this, but I do think she thinks that we, you and me, and our parishes have a responsibility to serve these people. I'll be honest with you, I'd rather the person who says we're going to build them housing than the person who says we're going to arrest them. You know. Um, which one of the candidates seems to think is what you would do. Um, you know, their homelessness is not a crime that you want to send somebody, you want to incarcerate somebody for, or send them through the legal system for. So I do think, I mean, I wish I had the easy answer. I don't. I, I'm glad that the candidates all recognize it as a problem because it is. I mean, it just the, I'm much less comfortable being in downtown Denver than I was five years ago, you know. To be honest with you. Um, so I do think we have to find the solution. You know, if, if, if I'm speaking as Dorothy Day, it's because, you know, well, we have to find that through our community. And again, don't look to um, the state to solve that, but we have to figure out how to speak to it. Maybe it's the, maybe it's the parishes that need to really speak to it in a more direct way. I mean, I don't know. That's funny. The National Council of um, Bishops should speak to it. Should they? Should they not? Well, I think they would. They they would send the thing down. Yeah, I think that would be good if they did. But you they know, don't. and again, it's you know, and, and things aren't you know, and again, these problems are always localized, you know, and so how they're going to get solved has to be get you know, it has to be on the local level. But I do, you know, I mean, the bishops speak to it. I think they could speak to it more clearly. Um, you know, I don't know, Father, would you agree with that? Or? Well, there, on the USCZ website, there's a whole section on affordable housing and homelessness. So we can't say that they don't speak about it at all. Um, okay. I think part of what they're trying to combat is the NIMBY thing that happens with both conservatives and liberals on both extremes of, oh, yeah, let's do this, but I don't want my property values to go down. I don't want to build a bigger thing 
right next to me. <clears throat> and and that's, that's a hard thing. I'd say I've seen at this parish a total extreme in terms of working with homeless of of making bologna sandwiches and passing them out with the Unitarians with no proclamation of Jesus, but a meeting of a material need at a very kind of safe whatever, which is even better than like writing a check, all the way to other parishioners who, in working with Christ in the City or another organization, have met one person and journeyed with that one person for a while and helping that one person into housing. And over time, speaking about Jesus in a trusted scenario, and even getting to the point where you bring that one person to Mass, and that very long, out of the richness of friendship, walking with someone, I think there's a, we need a lot more of that, which is not letting the government do it, and not saying, well, someone else should do it. It's the, like, Lord, what would you ask of me? And because doing my little part, whatever, having the type of relationship where Jesus can convict me of my ability and my responsibility and, my, and enabling me to love in the way that he is asking me to, not in the way that my comfort dictates, but in the way that my Lord dictates. Does that make sense? But I would say this does come up on, on, on the USCCB level it's just the homeless issue in Seattle is different than LA, is different than Denver, is different than Atlanta, is different than Watkins. It's different than Dallas, Dallas, Dallas. And so um, that's why the other principle that you brought up in the book of subsidiarity is, is, is issues ought to be solved first and foremost on the most local level possible because most issues are themselves have idiosyncrasies that can't be solved in Washington, D.C. And again, the beauty of an omnipotent and an omniscient God is he can work through you and me on the most subsidiary level of me and the Trinity dwelling within me. And to say, what do I do with this person here? And Lord, do I, at some point I have, I haven't gotten there yet because I've lived very destabilized with the move and all this stuff. But I would love to get to the point where I, I said, Lord, send me the right person and I will journey with that person and say, does this person need to go be reunited with family in California? Like, I'll commit to this person with whatever kind of financials they need to get them to whatever it is. That might, for me, come a few years from now when I'm not still learning what it means to be pastor. But that's a way in which it's, I think, if everybody did that once in their life, that would be way different than here's five dollars, here's a dollar, whatever it is. But again, not everybody is there. Not everyone has the comfort level, um, which is why we need to be dialoguing with our Lord. And that's even why like our, our own tithes to the church here and or other organizations just show us that even in the way we spend our money, that we don't just belong to ourselves. That in taking the gospel seriously, I live as if other people exist and are in need and that I, I need them as well, lest I live in my own bubble. And that's the beauty of the call of a serious Catholic. Any final thoughts? In the last like five, seven years, we've seen many um, parishes in the archdiocese have like multi-million dollar renovations. And even, you know, we're blessed that we have this center, this, this community center, but like how do we reckon like, well, we spent all this money, but we still have all four. And it's like, it's beautiful to have these beautiful churches and the artwork and stuff, but to spend seven to ten million dollars and we still have so much poverty and even for us as a parish like how can we like open up like this community center to people on the street like what, what can we do you know like to build use this for good instead of just our own use and our own is that directed to me or father 
or just anybody? I think that's a good question. I'll, I'll say we, it's already come up um, since we have a school and since we live in an era that is very concerned with school safety, um, we won't on campus be running a regular um, ministry here from this location. But that doesn't mean we can't get creative in other ways. But in terms of an ideal that you want to shoot for. Yeah. I'd also point but to... I, like, I th but I do think, you know, you're right. I mean, what we're... We, we, sh we need to be thoughtful about how we're spending the money that we, that we, that we give. You know? it's, we have that responsibility. We have, we have Catholic Charities and our own Darren Walsh, um, who's our parishioner, who's the president of Catholic Charities. Um, that is where a, a decent amount of resources, whatever is given to us, we pay uh, a tithe to the diocese and they use that to fund things that we ourselves could never do. And so the housing, um, there's, a, uh, there's affordable housing throughout the state. They're trying to find some up in the mountains, up by um, basalt, um, up north, um, kind of low income, fixed income, elderly. Um, that's part of the mission of Catholic Charities. But also, uh, we took 89, on, on the dime, Within a week's time, we took 89 immigrants from Mexico and put them up with our infrastructure in a way that we would no one parish would be able to pull off in a sustainable and dignified manner. And so there is a way in which we do the cooperation of a lot of our efforts um, to do things that, that plenty of um, parishes couldn't do by themselves. I'd say, and <clears throat> to speaking of beauty, Father um, Frank Chrysostom tells this story. Um, <clears throat> St. John the Divine is an Episcopal cathedral up in Harlem. And at one point, the rector was, go was, was going around and actually asking. It, it, it's one of the tallest church structures in North America. And it's very simple and it's very beautiful, but its construction costs a lot. And he ended up... Um, Go, th this couple came in, they were clearly from Harlem, uh, and he, he said, do you think this is too much? Is this absurd that we have such a beautiful place here? And, and the woman said, Father, we have no beauty in our lives. This is given to us. And so I think it can be a false dichotomy for us to say the church, right? I mean, it was Judas himself that said, oh, that beautiful thing, that good smelling perfume should be sold and given to the poor. Now, he had no real concern for the poor. He was just being nitpicky. But the, 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 um, the poor are entitled to beauty as well. And so our own re reception of them, and if I may point to, the cathedral does an amazing job of this. Um, if you've never been to our cathedral on Colfax, um, it's incredibly beautiful. And they hire docents that are there um, to just keep a, a, a sense of safety because there are people that come in with drugs or people that come in with, with um, mental instabilities and they're given plenty of leeway before um, but many people come in and they, they just want to be able to look up. They just want to be able to see the stained glass. And so we as a church also have a duty to provide the sacred for everyone who desires it. Because if we just go back to Russian concrete brutalism, because we can just crank it out, well, that was the same culture that turned over the disaster of Chernobyl out of the same culture of cranking it out, out of the same culture of the supremacy of the state. And so for us to build glorious things, to reflect God's glory, but invite anyone who wants to come, that actually reflects the notion and the invitation of Jesus. Final thought or final story or final um, impartation. <laughs> oh, gosh. 
I, no, let me think about it. <laughs> I'll let you. I, mean, I, I should have. I'll think about that. I'll, I'll be have ready before tomorrow. Okay. I don't really have one tonight. Great. Thank you for reading my book. <laughs> I, mean, I appreciate it. It's um, always a pleasure to talk about it. Next week I won't be here. I will be um, leading a, uh, the Kairos Retreat uh, uh, for Holy Family High School. Um, I've done that for the past four years. And until they find another um, suitable chaplain, I'm, I've committed to them. Um, Father Michael will be here. And, and part of what I'd like you to think about is what might we do as a community um, to put this, take Elisa's question, how might we, as a small community, uh, carry forth the moral legacy that Dorothy Day left us? And it might, be, it might be saying, doing the things that we're already doing, I can tell you not all of them are, are any longer sustainable, and some of the ones that we're charging them have left our parish since my coming. And so part of it is we have um, some reinvention to do, but also what new opportunities might we be able to do, if not corporately, definitely personally. Um, so it would be something to think about and discern between now and next week, as that will be one of the discussion questions. Uh, and now that we've all studied uh, some of this, we're all more morally culpable of living, of living in a way that's all the more aligned with the gospel so that we, we might not even be deserving of even a small beating, but that we might be able to go into the presence of our Lord and just say, Lord, I did as best I could. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant, and turn to your master's joy. Um, for our closing prayer, we have a, I have a uh, quote from um, a 1946 article from the Catholic Worker. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. What we would like to do is change the world. Make it a little simpler for people to feed, clothe, and shelter themselves as God intended them to do. And by fighting for better conditions, by crying out unceasingly for the rights of workers, the poor, and the destitute, the rights of the worthy and the unworthy. In other words, we can, to a certain extent, change the world. We can work for the oasis, the little cell of joy and peace in a hurried world. We can throw out our pebble into the pond and be confident that its ever-widening circle will reach around the world. We repeat, there is nothing we can do but love. And dear God, please enlarge our hearts to love each other, to love our neighbor, and to love our enemy as our friend. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God.